Hey guys, it's Anna from Brightling Gardens. It's a very sunny fall day here in Northern Michigan. And the topic of today's video surrounds something else that's very popular up here in Northern Michigan. And that is of course, lake shores. We have a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers, a lot of water in general up here. And along with a lot of these waterways comes erosion. So today's video is dedicated to erosion control in the form of native plants and how we can protect our shorelines before this erosion happens. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to identify signs of erosion on your own property. We'll go into the three zones of any shoreline. We're going to talk about six native plants that can be planted along shorelines to help prevent erosion. And finally, we're going to talk about how to create a sustainable and aesthetically pleasing landscape that can protect your shorelines from erosion. Diving right in, there are two main causes of land erosion that we struggle with that is from wind and from water. So today's video, of course, is going to be focused more on water erosion and what we can do with plants to kind of protect some of that soil from water erosion. Water erosion can happen around any body of water. It can be a large lake, a small lake, a river, a creek, an ocean. Anywhere that there's water flowing, you might be at risk of erosion. Protecting shorelines from erosion is crucial for maintaining healthy waterways. And using native plants is one of the best ways to do it. Today we're talking about some incredible native plants that thrive in different zones of your shorelines, each with its own unique benefits. Now let's talk about how to spot signs of erosion before it becomes a bigger problem. If you live anywhere near moving water or where water collects, here's a few key things to watch out for. First and foremost, exposed roots. If you see a tree or plant roots sticking out of the ground, that's a sign that the soil around those roots is washing away. Sign number two is undercutting. This happens when water eats away at the base of a slope or a shoreline, and it causes what looks like a small cliff to form on top. Of course, the more this undercutting occurs, the less stable that cliff on top becomes, and it does run the risk of falling directly into the water, just like you see the videos of the glaciers that kind of chip off at the very top and dump directly into the water. Third thing to look out for is going to be soil loss or gullies. Look for areas where water runoff is creating channels or washing soil back into the water. And last, look out for murky water near the shore. If the water near your shoreline is constantly muddy, it's often a sign that soil is eroding and being carried into the water. Now, of course, after the spring rains, this can be a common phenomena, but once those spring rains clear up and summer starts to happen, if you're still noticing murky or cloudy water near your waterway, you might be at risk for erosion. These are all indicators that erosion is taking place and addressing them early can prevent much bigger issues later on. Before we dive on into talking about our chosen plants, let's quickly talk about the three main zones of a shoreline, aquatic, transition, and upland. The aquatic zone is the area closest to the water, where plants may be fully submerged or standing in shallow water. This zone is key for stabilizing the water's edge and preventing wave erosion. Now keep in mind, in this area, since there is standing water, it takes a really specific type of plant to survive in these types of areas. Typically, these are at least going to be wet soil tolerant plants, but more likely they'll be categorized as an aquatic plant. The second zone is the transition zone. The transition zone sits just above the aquatic area where the soil stays consistently moist, but it's not fully submerged. It's the buffer between water and land and it absorbs runoff and supports plants with deeper roots. Finally, the upland zone is further away from the water where the soil dries out more quickly. Plants here deal with occasional moisture and sometimes flooding, but are mainly adapted to drier conditions. The upland zone is going to be home to a lot of your more popular plants unless they prefer a much drier soil, which in that case they will be considered waterlogged in that upland zone. Now let's look at the best native plants for each zone so that we can help stabilize your shoreline soil. Starting with the aquatic zone. So this was that first zone that we talked about. It's the area closest to the water and it typically stays submerged in water all the time. So we have a few specific plants that can tolerate that wet condition all the time. The first one I'm gonna highlight is our bristly sedge. Bristly sedge is a sedge or a grass. It is a really pretty native grass. I love the way that the fronds flop. 
keep in mind this is fall time so a lot of these plants are starting to enter their dormancy so they look a little floppier or a little ruddier than usual but they are healthy successful plants and next year they'll be so vibrant once we get them in the ground so i have my bristly sedge in front of me this guy can get anywhere from two to four feet as you can see before he collapsed here it looks like we almost got up to three feet on this one he does technically have a flowering time and that's early to midsummer. The flower on the bristly sedge looks exactly like a bristle. It's actually pretty cute, kind of has little spikes like a porcupine and it adds a lot of fun texture to any area that you're landscaping, especially if you have a lot of flowers planted in that area. The bristly sedge can just add some nice vibrant greens while adding a pop of texture that really stands out amongst the crowd. Your bristly sedge is going to want full to partial sun. It can definitely handle that full sun along the shoreline if you don't have any trees covering it. But if it's cast in shadow for a part of the day, it will do just fine with that as well. This guy likes that wet standing water and it has really dense fibrous roots that make it an excellent choice for the aquatic zone. My second recommendation for the aquatic zone is a flower that you've definitely heard of before. This is our blue flag iris. The blue flag iris is a native iris to Michigan, the Midwest, and other parts of the United States. And it has these really dense, thick rhizomes that are also very fibrous. They're really difficult to pull apart with your fingers and they're kind of difficult to chop with a spade unless you have a really sharp spade as well. So as you can imagine, these rhizomes do a great job of binding that soil together and preventing the water from washing it away. Blue flag iris does like full sun. It's going to flower more in full sun, but it will still thrive in partial shade. So if it's cast in shadow for a part of the day, that's completely fine. It can handle that standing water. So it's going to be a great option for the aquatic zone. This guy's gonna stay a little shorter, usually right around two feet. And on top, it blooms in late spring to early summer with a really pretty delicate blue iris flower highlighted with a yellow throat. It really stands out amongst the crowd and goes really nicely next to our bristly sedge. So if you're looking for two plants that go really well together and look nice right along that lakeshore in the aquatic zone, your bristly sedge and blue flag iris are going to be a great pair for that area. Moving up to the transition zone, where the soil stays consistently moist, here we find two powerful erosion fighters, swamp milkweed and joe pieweed. If you're familiar with common milkweed, swamp milkweed isn't too different. It's mostly its wet soil counterpart. As you can see, my swamp milkweed is fully in dormancy at this point in the year. Just these little sticks are standing up, but when it is in bloom, it is truly a stunner. In mid to late summer, this plant here will produce large clusters of vibrantly pink flowers. These do look somewhat similar to your common milkweed, but they're a deeper pink with a tighter cluster of flowers. These stay a little bit more compact and a little bit shorter, usually topping out right around three feet. These guys do like full sun, so if you're right on the edge of a lake or if you're in a sunny area of a river, this is going to be a really ideal plant for you to plant along your lakeshore. This guy likes moist to wet soil, so as a moist zone that does dry out from time to time, that transition zone is going to be a really good option for your swamp milkweed. Of course, an added benefit, this is a source of food and habitat for your monarch butterflies. They'll lay their larvae on the leaves and overall it's a pollinator haven. Next up is our Joe Pieweed. I have no idea why it's called Joe Pieweed. I think it's a terrible name for such a beautiful flower, but truly these are stunning flowers. Joe Pieweed is actually a really versatile plant. I have it growing just fine in my backyard and by no means do I have wet soil conditions back there. It thrives in the deep summer conditions, hot, hot sun, full, full sun, and gives you these beautiful, beautiful large clusters of fluffy pink flowers. Joe Pieweed is gonna be one of the taller plants that we talk about today. In ideal conditions, this guy can get up to six feet, which is crazy tall, but when you see those clusters of flowers on top and the structure of the plant as a whole, it just makes sense and the look really comes together. Joe Pieweed does bloom in partial shade, so that's a unique attribute of this plant. If you have a shadier area on your property or if you have a tree, 
that's hanging over a river or hanging over a lakeshore area, this is gonna be a really good option for you. Because Joe Pieweed is so tall, of course that means its taproot is very deep. So the depth of these roots is one of the crowning attributes that makes it an excellent choice for erosion control. I do have an honorable mention that I don't have in stock currently. Uh, it's a really popular plant, but it's another one that would do really well in your transition zone. And that's going to be your marsh blazing star. If you're not familiar with the blazing star family, typically they are topped with these tall spires of purple feathery blooms. They are truly a stunner. They bloom a little bit later in the season and these marsh blazing stars can get up to four feet tall so they can add a lot of really delicate height without overwhelming your space. These guys, as the name suggests, do well with wet or marshy soil. So these would also be a great option for your transition zone. Moving on up to our very last zone, and that's going to be our upland zone. Soil is pretty dry in the upland zone, but it is prone to seasonal flooding. So while the majority of plants can thrive in this zone the majority of the year, it does take a special genre of plants to thrive during those spring floods. I'm gonna highlight two plants today. This is a pretty versatile zone. There's probably gonna be a lot more plants than just these two that can survive, but these are two of my favorites that add a lot of beauty and functionality to your space. First on my list is going to be my bog goldenrod. Of all the goldenrods, I think bog goldenrod might be one of my favorites. It has a dense cluster of yellow flowers right at the top, almost in a similar style to your marsh blazing star. I love the fact that the foliage stays nice and low while it shoots that tall bloom straight up and above everything else. So this guy here looks really good, especially when it's planted with some other lower flowers. If you put your bog goldenrod right in the middle, you're going to see that beautiful yellow bloom shoot straight up in the middle and it will highlight all of your other plants. Bog goldenrod does prefer full sun, so if you have an area that isn't shrouded in any shade and tends to get at least six to eight hours of sun per day, bog goldenrod is gonna do just fine there. It does like a little bit more of a moist soil, but it can handle some of those drier conditions. So anywhere between the transition zone and the upland zone would be a good option for your bog goldenrod. In ideal conditions, your bog goldenrod is going to get about two to four feet, and that is really just that cluster of flowers right in the middle. As I mentioned before, the foliage does tend to stay a little bit lower, so it really highlights that bloom right there in the middle. And perhaps my favorite attribute of this plant is the fact that it is a late bloomer. So we're talking about late summer to early fall. When you start to see those leaves transition into those oranges and reds, that's when you're gonna start to see your bog goldenrod get that gorgeous yellow bloom, and it just fits in with the fall vibe. So it's a perfect addition. Last on my list is one that also made my drought tolerant list. So this is going to seem perplexing. It's just a really versatile plant that can handle a lot of different conditions. And that's going to be your bergamot. So bergamot can technically handle drought-like conditions once it's fully established, but the reason that it can is because its root structure is so vast and so deep. And of course, this is what also makes it an excellent erosion control plant. Bergamot spreads readily and easily. It's also deer resistant, which helps it spread even faster. And I love the scent and the blooms on it. So this is wild bergamot. This is going to have the pale purple flowers on it. There's also bee balm bergamot that's going to have the fiery red blossoms on it. Both are going to be great options for your upland zone. A good thing about the bergamot is despite the seasonal flooding, some of these upland zones might also have drought in the middle of the summer. Your bergamot is going to be able to sustain those drought-like periods and thrive into the fall months. Like the bog goldenrod, your bergamot is going to get about two to four feet tall in ideal conditions. It likes that full sun, but can also handle partial shade. So if you have an area that's cast in shadow by a tree or a large shrub, this is going to be an excellent option for you. Last but certainly not least, I did want to recommend a tree that can handle these shorelines really well. And it does a really good job if you're in a marshy area or an area that's low lying and prone to flooding. It does a really good job of actually sucking up excess water to help control some of that saturated soil so that other plants can grow in that area. The tree that I'm referring to is our speckled elder tree. Speckled elder trees are a full size tree, so this guy's gonna get anywhere from 25 to 30 feet tall. It does have a, technically a bloom time in the summer, and it has these cute little pods that almost look like miniature pine cones. 
it just adds a lot of fun texture, a lot of fun color, and the leaves get a very stunning ruddy red in the fall. So it kind of has that four season interest for you, but it is so beneficial to your soil. And trust me, nothing can help erosion quite like a tree can. So if you have some big erosion issues and you need something that's fast growing and can really get deep into the soil to stabilize it, speckled elder is gonna be a really good option for you. That was technically eight native plants that we shared with you today. We're passionate about native plants. Native plants can solve a lot of our erosion issues. A lot of our environmental issues in general can be solved by the plants that originally were meant to be here. So never underestimate the power of relocating, rewilding your yard with native plants. So once you've planted all of these native plants, you're probably wondering, okay, when am I going to start to see a difference in my soil erosion? Typically, we like to say around one to two years. And the reason for that is we want to give those roots enough time to spread out and stabilize the soil before we can count on them for erosion control. In the meantime, after you plant your native plants, it's really important to keep them well watered. So if you're in the upland zone and it's not during a time of flood, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're watering those daily until they can be properly established. You can also add something called an erosion blanket. Typically erosion blankets are a dense material that just covers the surface of the soil and prevents water from actually accessing the soil so that it can wash it away in large amounts. So water will still be able to seep through to water the plants, but it won't be able to flow in there and create channels and divots to be able to wash that soil away. Erosion control blankets can be made out of a wide variety of materials. Unfortunately, a lot of those materials are plastic or man-made materials. So I do encourage you to look for an all natural biodegradable option just because that's way better for the environment, especially if you live along a waterway. I'm gonna link a couple of my favorite options in the description down below. These are made of completely organic materials and they'll break down over the seasons. So these are a really good option for you to use right after you've planted your native plants for that one to two year period while we're really waiting for those roots to take hold and start to stabilize that soil. That felt like a fast and furious one. I don't know why, but we covered eight different plants today. There are so many more options out there. These eight plants of course do well in northern Michigan and other parts of the Midwest but where you're located there might be a better option for you so I encourage you to check out a couple online resources that have some nationwide recommendations and I'll link those in the description below as well. Erosion control is a huge deal up here we have some very beautiful homes that are sitting right on the lake shore and of course just as we've seen erosion take place in other parts of the country we have it up here in northern Michigan as well even on some of our inland lakes that hardly get any waves at all. So if you live near a waterway, a river, a stream, a channel, or a lake, definitely take erosion control into perspective. Even if you don't have any issues currently, planting some native plants now could really help protect you in the future. And even if you're in a low risk area for erosion, just keep in mind that some of these water tolerant plants just look pretty along your shoreline and help to support your local ecosystem. So they're worth it. If you have any questions for me on erosion control, on any of the native plants that I mentioned today, or anything else to do with native landscaping, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. As always, we appreciate you spending some time on our channel today. It seriously helps out small businesses like ours so much. Thanks for tuning in, and I sure hope to catch you next time. Bye-bye.